Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, hello, everybody. I should say good evening here, but um, I'm sure it's a good morning for everybody else. So, yes, uh, first, I need to start with an apology because I just realized I made a typo when, um. When submitting the abstract and it says economy and I'm really into digital ecology and uh, uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be clear what I mean clearer what I mean by that. Um, uh, after the presentation, so, yes, this is um, this talk today built on my previous work on couch surfing the, the field work that I've been. Yeah, it took quite a few years to to complete. However, what I'm trying to. Um, what I'm hoping to do, uh, you know, over the next months is write a paper about platformization kind of through the lens of, you know, kind of looking at generations, like subsequent generations of platforms and their, their ecosystemic dynamics and effects. So this is kind of where, how I'm going to try to leverage this previous uh, research material here and I'm hoping to, to present bits and pieces of that uh, during today's, uh, today's talk. So, yeah, to, to start off, uh, I want to say that, you know, the rise of the web carried the promise to transform existing institutional structures by creating novel, diverse organizational forms. But 30 years later, you know, our digital ecosystem is variously referred to as sanitized, centralized, gentrified, tree like, etc. And um, is marked by platform dominance, almost a truism these days. So, and there has been a growing research effort across disciplines to um, explain platformization and um, a previous uh, answers, I'd say, uh, to the question of how we ended up with the, with the platformized web can be broken down into 3 streams roughly. And this is, I should note, this is going to by no means going to be, you know, exhaustive, but uh, the 1st, uh, Kind of uh, of the 3 main ones, the 1st, 1 would be the narratives of lost innocence or fall from grace. Um, in that, you know, well, known, if not slightly. Dated storyline, open ended experimentation and cooperation falls victim to corporate takeover becomes absorbed into logics of venture capitalism, which leads to the enclosure of our digital habitat. Which frames as 1st and foremost as passive clients of curated apps and has the long term effects of stifling social innovation. The 2nd narrative focuses on how becoming a platform winner exploited the existing legal frameworks, especially in the US. And, uh, an example of that is the leveraging of antitrust law by Amazon. There's, I just copied a fragment from the most recent paper by Shoshana Zuboff published just this week on how. Uh, surveillance capitalism develops in stages and each stage creates it's like a, like a cascade of in which each stage creates uh, creates conditions and constructs a scaffolding for the next and each builds on what went before um employing various existing legal frameworks finally the third uh, line of inquiry traces how platforms leverage digital uh, technology to create centralized ecosystem for novel data production practices that enact their programmability to decentralize data production and recentralized data collection. Quoting Anna Helmond here, um, it unveils API tools which create platform ecosystem as hierarchical constellations with central co connectors and a myriad of smaller complementers dependent on the former, right? And the entire industries and societies become drawn into their dynamic and become transformed in the process. So it emphasizes that platforms put people and things into specific kinds of relations that are reconfigured in a constantly varying and experimentally modulated ways. So uh, I'd say while these, uh, you know, previous research, research is very, very valuable, valuable, and to varying degrees considers relationships between between platforms and their environment. They usually emphasize, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, the notion of power or control or force in a in ways that is uh, not necessarily productive for you know does does not you you know leave space for for newer for for other explanations for for does not account for. All that's been going on, and uh, this is how we arrived at the sharing economy topic. If you remember, and some of you may remember the optimistic narrative surrounding the rise of sharing economy from the early um, 2010s. Yeah, here's an example of uh, Rachel Botsman uh, TED talk. So my question is, where are all these 
examples or most of those examples of, of your collaborative platforms gone these days. Um, um, so in order to investigate that, I suggest that we need a slightly different approach than the previous ones. And that is one that relies on an ecological epistemology and uh, looks beyond winner platform winners, right? So uh, I would uh, I would move away from the metaphors of power, and I would build on ecological epistemology rooted in cybernetics, especially the work of Gregory Bateson, who, who defined ecosystems in informational terms. And, you know, information is what travels and connects across heterogeneous boundaries and allows to account for effects of particular configurations of, say, digital organizations in heterogeneous terms, not only in terms of market signals, for instance, um, but accounts for patterns veering towards disintegration and aiming at corrections that affect individuals, groups, institutions, etc., and, and beyond, right? And importantly, it allows to focus on dynamics uh, that platform growth uh, gives rise to. Uh, so rooting, I'm rooting the paper in, uh, you know, in the, my previous uh, fieldwork tracing the history of couch surfing and early collaborative hospitality uh, platform and subsequent changes and in conceptualizations uh, done in collaborations with Attila Martin, who's based at uh, CBS and Mike Zungel in um, Liverpool. Um, all right. So. Founded in 2003 in the US, uh, couchsurfing uh, had a very successful takeoff. It, uh, and I would suggest that would be a comp that's due to a combination of three types of dynamics, three, um, yeah, intensifying dynamics that, uh, that uh, really set in gear participation, engagement, um, network effects, et cetera. So first, uh, they, this platform revived the ideals of op open collaboration and hacking for social good, this time with a novel element of face-to-face -face encounters. And they have embraced the idea of hackathons and invited all interested members to volunteer and help building the platform. Uh, also, um, Couchsurfing became an early harbinger of sharing economy, and it was amongst the, the first ones to scale trust by engineering um, reputation systems. And it also became part of the web 2.0 tide of social media and uh, people were thrilled to find your friends there. And, uh, you know, a for instance, a famous, you know, get together uh, of its members in 2005 snowballed to some 150 people. Um, it's, it, it was a validation for, for the participants of the magic power of such a new medium. But this, um, Early success quickly gave rise to a crisis that nearly spelled the death of the platform. Uh, but what is more, uh, that was only the first one in a series of crises or even near deaths. So in 2006, the leader of the platform who was still doing most of the programming was burnt out. And on top of that came a catastrophic database crash, which made him announce the end of Cursor. At this time, it was the outpour of volunteer help which helped, uh, which saved the platform and became, it became rapidly rebuilt. But immediately lack of adequate governance structures led to a crisis of its, uh, you know, very loosely codified duocratic organizational model. Volunteer frustrations were, was mounting and that led to a schism between supporters of a fully transparent open source organization and the informal leadership group, which supported a more top-down organization. The crisis culminated when the latter announced that Couchsurfing will move forward with a formalized leadership and will apply to become a charitable organization in the US. Many disenchanted volunteers left, while the patience of others was extended by the prospect that Couchsurfing would operate as a charity. And at the same time, funds to repair and expand the growing platform was scarce. Um, and incoming participants were actually increasingly accustomed to smooth and stable social media platforms. Um, supported by extensive budgets. The tipping point came when the federal authorities rejected the charity application, which should be read in the context of the rapid growth and first serious scandals uh, at the corporate social media platforms of Google, feeling that they have no option uh, left due to a massive debt the leaders turned to venture capital. 
And in that moment, in 2011, Couchsurfing was reborn as a Silicon Valley startup, which meant that all volunteer relationship had to be discontinued and replaced by employees. Most importantly, the transformation caused a profound legitimacy crisis amongst its members. Even worse, those who stayed did not see the promised improvements that was supposed to come with the financial injection. In the back office, turns, it turned out, the newly employed tech staff was scrambling to produce a scalable business model. In that process, they spent most funds on an automated system for matching users, which have never to come. In that context, the investors decided to leave, where in the year uh, 2015, despite intensive efforts of a small group of dedicated employees, Couchsurfing was bankrupt again. But a small private investment fund resurrected once again, at this time as a niche digital business, more reliant on freemium model with initial benefits for subscription members and more mainstream trial and error, A-B testing, probing, what business model changes are the participants still going to accept? Hmm? So uh, nonetheless, the scaled down, couchsurfing continued to survive until COVID hit. And at that moment, you can see a, a screen on the illustration on the right. Uh, the only solution the company could resort to or imagine they could resort to was asking for financial contributions from the users. And it's still unsure if, uh, if they're going to survive. So, uh, yes, I packed all my, uh, all the field work and the empirical story into one slide. And now I just, uh, want to, yeah, spend, a uh, spend a few moments on, um, figuring out what are the key insights from that case and what do they, what are the broader, um, broader insights with regards to sharing economy platforms and beyond. So this. These turbulences are actually a good illustration of what um, Gregory Bates called uh, problems and solutions. And this problems and solutions are, is, are what technology is, because technology is, he said, um, interventions, linear interventions, conscious, purposive interventions into complex circularities of the of the world. And here we can see that, you know, uh, each solution they come up with immediately gives rise to novel and ever bigger problem, which in turn requires an ever more expansive solutions. And these from that, you know, furthermore, that these purposive solutions are rather are no, no, no solutions at all. They're actually quick fixes that are likely to become self perpetuating and ecologically destructive games without ends in that process uh, with each of those adaptations moving forward solving next crisis the platform becomes uh, loses a proportion of its flexibility to adjust it's becoming more specialized and committed it's dependent on the chosen solution try and less able to cope with crisis in the environment so for instance in uh, 2020 they couldn't uh, address volunteers so they couldn't address their members to to come and help, I don't know, code, uh, do something or do something else, something more creative. The only solution that they could come up with is to ask for money, right? For instance, um, because they have depleted the, the goodwill of volunteers say, over over the over many, many years, right? So moving forward and to a broader uh, to a broader perspective, uh, digitalization uh, not only allows for tech fixes to be de developed much faster, but for instance, um, a reborn couch surfing 2.0 in 2006 was just set up, you know, from scratch almost in like 10 days or so, but also, um, systemic stress shifts faster and further. Um, here, um, from, from in that context, platformization becomes unveiled as a runaway pattern and, um, in where at least 3 types of dynamics kind of become collapsed together and intensify. Platforms are prone to become locked in a pattern whereby they need to resort to ever more expansive ad hoc measures to survive in short term. For instance, taking uh, venture capital money just to survive in the short term and we're going to get, um, uh, worry about the massive legitimacy crisis later, right? At the same time, they are making entire societies dependent on their systems. Uber just wants us to use Uber. 
and more and, and become a lock-in user, right? And uh, But on top of that, there's this dynamic that happens uh, between platforms. So platform dominance can only be achieved by trumping the previous leaders. Yeah? So they're trying to escape forward because they hear their you know, competition just right behind their back. So, but then we turn to Bateson and uh, Bateson says, you know, as an anti-Darwinism as he was, that dependence such as, you know, over-specialization to, you know, reliance on a too narrowly defined business model, say, can be lethal to the entire ecosystem because the unit of survival is not a single organism, uh, say a single platform, but a flexible organism uh, and its environment. So if, if, uh, a, a, a single organism is going to um, poison its environment, it's ultimately going to die. So in that, you know, moving moving forward and, tr and translating that to a digital ecology um, insight, uh, the history or story of cap surfing is indicative of wider ecological developments by which a loss of flexibility has become the price for escalating growth across the whole digital platform ecosystem only to be maintained by massive financial investments. So it does what it does, it, it unveils an erosion of diversity of ideas and organizational forms that kind of die off in that um, in that process. Hence, moving forward, if we uh, if we hit next big crises, we don't have other like repertoires of other, I'd say, organizational forms um, to um, to leverage in a, in a in new uh, in new uh, situations. All right. So the question is here: um, What was the role of sharing economy platforms in intensifying platformization? I would say there is a particular dynamic that uh, that that um, interacts with what I've already um, described before, which is you know, a particular dynamic of a dynamic of intensification whereby investors were betting on future platform winners after the financial crisis, especially those among the, you know, the collection of all these collaborative uh, platforms um, from the picture that had so a so-called strong business model, such as, um, uh, you know, a, a cut of every transaction, <laughs> right? And in that way, they, um, uh, they have boosted only a particular type of uh, of sharing economy platforms, and with and those that uh, that um, rely uh, heavily on the notion of micro entrepreneurs, um, and not and in that process, um, kind of alternative versions of what the sharing economy could have become died off, right? And the final final point is about considering the web's future. So, um, uh, as an e I would suggest that it's super important to consider the health of the web as an ecosystem and the continued diversity of ideas it can maintain um, seriously to stop the erosion and rebuild diversity of organizational forms. And in particular, consider that. Um, the erosion of the environment is likely to ultimately be lethal to digital platforms, the platform winners uh, that are faring well right now. And we should actually forget linear progress, instead focus on circularities, deaths and rebirths as a continuation of life. And not necessarily, it's not necessarily about nostalgia for early web, I would say. Embracing ecosystems as patterns of heterogeneous relationships uh, is something that a digital ecology allows, uh, for instance, uh, as it um, um, lets us look further beyond effects that only materialize in homogenous terms, for instance, this market terms, but in terms of, I don't know, maybe um, erosion of institutions, um, etc. So, okay, in that context, I was just thinking about platform cooperatives and um, the problems in that promise or that alternative version. Um, of the of web's future and the hopes so yeah we might pick it up in the q a thank you very much